welcome to Ask for GTV's news for Wednesday, June 15, 2022. I'm Triska Campbell with the details. Steps are being made to streamline the application process for Vincentians who are seeking employment with the Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines. Last month, government signed a memorandum of understanding with Royal Caribbean to recruit up to 2,000 Vincentians ahead of the start of this year's cruise season. To date, around 400 persons have been employed. Speaking at a press conference today, Minister of Tourism Carlos James says the last recruitment fair encountered a number of hiccups such as persons showing up without the necessary paperwork and mass gathering. He announced that mobile recruitment centers will be set up to assist persons interested in being employed with the cruise line. This week's recruitment drive will be decentralized and new applicants will have the option of three centers. The Kaliakua Community Center on June 17th, Rosebank Community Center on June 18th, and Georgetown Anglican Church Hall on June 20th. Challenging for someone from Sandy Bay or Oya to travel to Kingston. There's transportation costs, there's food, and not being able to get through in, in, the, in the queue for an application. Um, and then you have to come back the next day or two or three days. So we, we thought it best to decentralize to um, selected locations across the country where we can facilitate as much um, applicants um, who may have an interest in, in, in the, the recruitment um, process. In fact, we'll have about maybe half a dozen or so persons um, on, on computers, um, internet access, to facilitate the application process for you. Minister James says that 753 applications have been lodged in the online registration portal to date, and out of that number, there are 310 persons to be interviewed. These interviews will take place on June 21st and 23rd. We want to have, uh, again, hundreds of people showing up Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday next week, thinking that, well, we're going to come to get our names done for um, to, to be selected and interviewed right away. The Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday will be reserved for persons who are then notified of the interview because they will only be doing interviews on Tuesday, Wednesday, next week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Between Friday of this week, Saturday of this week, and Monday of next week, that's the, these are the three important dates for new applicants. You have to attend this pre-application um, session at the recruitment sites we've identified, um, which is Calico Town Hall, Rosebank Community Center, and the Georgetown Anglican Church um, Parish Hall. That's Friday, Saturday, and Monday. New applicants should turn up to those sites where they can register their information to be selected for the interview. So. If you're hearing this and you, you, you're saying, well, Royal Caribbean is coming next week, I'll wait until next week to go and, and get my, my name down. You have to do that on Friday, you have to do that on Saturday, and also on Monday at the respective locations, Calico, Rosebank, and Georgetown. Minister James says the program is expected to enhance the skill sets of young Vincentians. Quite a number of hotels that are coming in the next two, three, four years. The, the major hotels in the Grenadines, they, they sometimes constantly, almost every week, are looking for persons, um, specialist positions, persons in, not just persons at, at, at entry-level jobs, but specialist positions in, in terms of hospitality. And we are short on that in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And this is also a very good opportunity for persons to go off, even those with limited experience, to go off and receive the training and we may look at it as, as employment, and it's employment for a lot of young people, but also um, from a policy level, I think it's an, an opportunity to be afforded um, uh, the exposure in, in hospitality and the training that they'll, they, that they'll receive, and then hopefully they can return here um, at some point to contribute to the development of the hospitality sector and the services that we offer here in St. Vincent and Grenadines within the tourism industry. By and large, this is one of the, 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 the larger part of the, the whole idea of this mass recruitment drive in which we're able to ramp up our numbers 
in terms of persons who have the skill sets within tourism and hospitality. And I think that is one of the things that we, we, we really um, will take away from this exercise, this recruitment exercise that is, is taking place um, between gov the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and Royal Caribbean. Prime Minister Dr. Afghan Savs has said that the amount of space needed for the port modernization project at Rose Place, fisher folk will not be able to remain around the area. During his weekly appearance on NBC Radio's Face to Face program today, the Prime Minister said that the Grenadines Jetty and Regional Jetty will be constructed as part of the port modernization project, hence having fisher folk in the area will be contradicting and raise security concerns. The port project, funded by the Caribbean Development Bank at a cost of 185 million U.S. dollars, will see the Lower Kingston area transformed into a modern, into a modern seaport. That the container port is phase one of the development down there, costing over 600 million U.S. dollars. Modern port, but we have to build out also. The, I have to build out the the for a Grenadines jetty and a regional and a regional jetty. So I, I need space also for that. But in any event, you want to tell me any modern port anywhere in the world, a handful of fishermen, both for their own security as well as the security of the port. Prime Minister Gonsalves further noted that of all the fishermen who claim to be affected by the port modernization project in Rose Place, only four of them are actually residents of Rose Place. He said that fishermen were given a great deal with a compensation package and the opportunity to relocate at any other fishing sites. Do you know that of the fishermen come there is only four of them at Rose Place? And there's a good compensation package and people are choosing where they're going to relocate. Okay. Some of them, I was advised, some of them go in, you may go Calakwa, some may go Rusha Bay, some may go Loma, mm -hmm. some may go Kittel. You, you, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, Johnny okay. B? Yes, yes, eh? yes. Clay Valley. Mm -hmm. you, 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 you over. So there are options. My, my listen. But the other thing is this, I made it clear that the container port is phase one of the development down there, costing over 600 million U.S. dollars, modern port. In a recent interview with SVG TV News, President of the National Fisher Folk Association, Winsport Harry, said that the Rose Place Fisher Folk are worried about being without a job as the port modernization project has resulted in them being forced to find a new location to operate from. Harry says there is also division being created between boat owners and fisher folk. He explains that fishers had rejected the government's compensation package as they wanted the government to relocate them first. However, boat owners accepted the package, leaving some fishers without a job. And from the National Fisher Folk um, side, I, I think that the way how the industry is really going, looking at um, all my primary organization, I really like to see how you could build the primary fisher folks organization. You could see the problem that we have with the fisher folks in, 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 in Calakwa. To see how the organization is gone down the fisher folks out there was spent almost a year without um, getting somewhere proper to clean, to store the fish. And now you're telling us some Kingston to go to Calakwa. There, there will be a lot of um, corruption in, in, in Calakwa because there's corruption already when I go to Calakwa and say, well, the fisher folks of Rose Place is looking for space. Oh, the fisher folks can't come out there. There's no space, even when we go to Clay Valley. So um, it's the same thing we are getting. We are being pushed out and forced out. And the package I said to the fisher folks is really, really not nice. Government is expected to pay out over $800,000 to our root farmers. Prime Minister Dr. Alf Gensavs made the announcement today in an interview with the Agency for Public Information. Dr. Gensavs said the arrangement is being made and should be finalized within the next few days. You know, the last crop, they, 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 they suffered because of suffering. 
they couldn't they couldn't sell the factory mashup. You know, you know what I mean? We we're, were rebuilding that. Um, so what we decided to do is, and they had they had our route in the ground. So on the basis of the sales we said made the previous year, um, Sabi and Gomery came by and asked me whether we could um, do something to help them now. So we agreed at cabinet to give them 50% of what they would have made had um, and they would have sold had they had they been able to sell. In other news, government has identified a number of buying depots which are to be reckoned, refurbished sorry, as a part of the plan to improve the agricultural operations across the island. This was announced by Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development, Sabota Caesar, during a tour of the North Leeward communities on Tuesday. Officials from the ministry visited a number of farms to discuss ways to alleviate challenges affecting farmers. Minister Caesar says after the buying depot in Belmont, Rose Hall is re renovated. It will become a main commercial space for North Leeward farmers. This facility will be rehabilitated in due course. We had to utilize the Rose Bank Center to do the purchasing for the Love Box initiative. It is the view, it is the intention of the government and particularly of the Ministry of Agriculture to find the necessary resources to be able to retrofit this building so that it will become the center for the purchasing of commodities from farmers in this area. We are utilizing the Love Box initiative over the next, next six months to build out a cadre of farmers who will sell to this marketing platform for local consumption and also for export. And we must take this all in the context that we are in a world that is becoming quickly, globally, food insecure. In St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we have food security and we have a duty to other member states in the OECS and in CARICOM as a food exporter to continue to produce and to have the marketing platforms which are necessary so that we can ensure that our farmers and our stakeholders in the agriculture sector that they continue to thrive and develop the agriculture sector here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Parliamentary representative for North Leeward and Minister of Tourism, Carlos James, says the availability of selling markets continues to hinder major agricultural production in SVG, adding that the refurbished buying depots will help to address this problem. We are embarking on a national program to revitalize a number of um, these depot sites, and I'm quite happy that the, the farmers in North Leeward will be given an opportunity to have a location where they can bring their produce and receive their hard-earned cash and revenue for their produce. So one of the things which has deterred um, major production in, in farming in North Leeward over the years is the availability of markets. And sometimes farmers, they go out and they work hard, and then you know, the, the prices on, on, on the market is not necessarily the most um, suitable in terms of um, the, the demand and supply. But we're happy that we're able to, uh, from a national front, be able to um, purchase as much produce from farmers. And from here, we do the packaging, we sort in the buying, and then we export out to a central process, a central holding area for further export. Minister James says the plans to refurbish buying depots is part of the government's strategy to lower the country's food imports bill. Over the next few months, we have to obviously look at the food importation bill, particularly in the hotel sector, tourism sector, and to limit the amount of um, importation of, of produce and, and other foods to in, in the tourism sector. Quite naturally, when we're able to purchase a number of, of produce from farmers, not just here in North New, but nationally, we're then able to identify source markets, um, able to deliver produce to some of the major hotels. For instance, Sandals, you're talking about thousands and thousands of root crops, um, vegetables, 
um, annually. Um, and, and, and this is going to be something which our farmers are going to have to ramp up production to meet the local demand. But also uh, a buy-in depot like, like this, this one in Belmont will be able to serve um, in, in terms of the collection of, of, of produce so that we can distribute um, equitably across the, the, the national um, distribution channels but also to export regionally and, and, and internationally. Local farmers continue ex to express concern about the increase in incidence of perdial larceny. Notley was farmers tell SVG TV News they are doing all they can to secure their investments, but crop and livestock thieves are too often getting the best of them. We hear more in this report. One thing you do, you can't stop thief. You can't stop thief at all. Farmers in the North Leeward areas are questioning if they will ever get any relief from acts of pretty larceny. They say thieves are mobilizing vehicles and coming to farms at night to steal root crops and livestock that they have invested large sums of money to maintain. Seven goat on five sheep. So they steal the five sheep, leave the goats. I got to cut them to say, say $2,500 because they were big sheep and they're the heavy in lump. But my incident is just, is like, a day, just like a day, a night, just a night, because I change the animals, them the Sunday morning, the Monday morning, and I come again. So they come like the poor, so watch. Farmers have been going to great lengths to try to prevent pretty larceny, including sleeping on their farms and using security dogs. Even still, the thieves are winning. The only thing I feel if I was going to stay on the farm. But not always the farmer will always could stay on the farm because they have to make other move on them things. And sometimes some of the farms, they mean get a house that the farmers could stick around to protect the farm. I had to sacrifice my, the comfort of my, my parents' home, which where I, I farm, family based and grew up. And I decided that I will you know, make residents closer to the farm. So I erected a, a small farmhouse and there I live and then I being able to supervise on a more consistent base my, my, my farm, my animals and then it reduce the the, 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 the the case of predilacity for me. However, there are neighbors around who still suffers from that because they will when they leave the farm in the evening when they get back in the morning, they will have whether animals go missing, crops go missing and stuff like this. For female farmers though, the option of camping out at farms overnight presents additional challenges. No, I not promise that one day. Because with all crime I go right now, I not promise that. I'm a woman, so I not promise that one day. Come and go. Pretty larceny leaves farmers feeling frustrated and out thousands of dollars, even with the police force employing night patrols on farms. It's a big frustrating situation because um, I know of some farmers, they could have been better off, but because of the same incident of pretty larceny, they um, would have um, lost so much and you know, it, it keeps depleting their, their, their production. From, 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 like, from hearing like reports over the last year, I will say about $50,000 altogether different farmers would have lost. You understand? Um, when they report, because some, and, and different occasions, some will say, okay, I, somebody stole 12 of my goats. Now, 12 goats could, could take you up to the value of about maybe, maybe $3,000. Three, four thousand dollars depends on the sizes and the age range and stuff like that. The police can be all over. Honestly, the police can be all over. So we don't have to give antique. We don't have to give the police the credit. You know because they just try their best. They just do the best they could. For me, personal or wrong, I see the police does make the best effort they could. Commissioner of Police Colin John waiting on the issue during the WFM issues at hand earlier this week, saying they are seeing increased incidents of pretty larceny. He says law enforcement has been able to intercept shipments of stolen produce and livestock. What we have noticed that persons who not necessarily live in the area of persons have rented vehicles and they'll move from Kingston and go to um, Leeward or go to Spring Village 
and steal persons, animals. We have conducted stop and search at different times of the day and we'll be able to intercept persons in vehicles like that and brought them to justice. Commissioner made a call for these to feel the full weight of the law. So these are things that really uh, have to um, intensify and, and ensure mm-hmm. also that persons who are buying these things, that they stop and that when we take them to court, that the, I hope that the magistrate would give them a harsh sentence so mm-hmm. it would really it would deter persons from wanting to buy or receive those stolen goods. Despite these challenges, farmers say they will not be discouraged from doing what they love. Reporting for SVG TV News, Christina Smith. The Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment said it is closely monitoring the current situation of the hand, foot and mouth disease in the country as there have been confirmed cases in educational institutions. Hand, foot and mouth disease is a common viral illness among infants and children under the age of five years, but can also occur in adults. Local pediatrician at Andrews uh, uh, Pediatric Clinic in the Caribbean Kidney and Medical Center in Kingston, Dr. Sharian Davis Andrews, uh, shared with us for GTV News some of the ways the virus can be spread, uh, such as through oral secretions and uh, facial substances, which she said could be, mis- uh, could be minimized through proper hygiene. Here is... is, is is paid to just ensuring that proper cleaning of the children and cleaning of surfaces. Um, and also just to stress too that if somebody is sick, ensure that they stay home because once they're febrile, once they're having the rash, they can spread it. So it's really just educating teachers as well as parents. Although the viral illness can be passed on to adults, Dr. Davis Andrews said it is not something that adults should be too worried about. I would never say that teachers should be worried. I think teachers should be educated and aware of what needs to be done. So if I would encourage teachers to to sanitize as much as possible, understand that they're also protecting themselves by doing um, by implementing those practices. Um, it is possible that teachers could get infected. The, the, the infection is usually much milder in adults um, and in teenagers. However, it's not something to walk around being afraid of. It's just to be aware of con- and cognizant of the dangers and definitely pay the necessary precautions that they need to take. Dr. Andrews further noted that the illness can be recurring and reiterated the need to practice proper hygiene. Last, the last bout of hand, foot, mouth. Um, I saw patients and they've returned this time around with it. It is something that is usually quite present, but you may have um, significant rise in the number of cases at certain times of the year. Um, Definitely for us in the rainy season is when um, you tend to see a lot of cases. Um, They also talk about the summer period. Um, So this is definitely around the time that you'll, you'll see cases. But especially in our tropic setting, it can happen more than once. Throughout the year. Noting that there is currently no set cure for the hand, foot, and mouth disease, Dr. Andrews said patients are usually given over the counter medication for the fever and rash that comes along with it. However, medication would differ depending on the child and physician seen. The prescription depends on what or what the child has and how extensive the problem is. Um, so the first stage of the infection usually is just fever. Um, so in that phase, they definitely need some fever medications or what we call antipyretics. So that is like Tylenol or paracetamol, paramol. Um, and if necessary, with caution, ibuprofen usually directed by the physician if necessary. Um, and then sometimes they may present with vomiting, abdominal pain. So it's important to ensure that you're given rehydration So or rehydration methods may include Pedialyte um, or some unsweetened juices, etc., just to ensure that they remain hydrated. Um, for the rash, there is a wide range of products that are being used, but I think um, definitely one of the safest things that we've, we've, we've used so far, which works for most, is like calamine lotion. Um, there are other medicated drugs that I think would have to depend on the physician who's seen um, before using. So it's not a standard 
Um, these are not standard drugs to use. But definitely for the itching, then we use something like an antihistamine or anti-itch um, medication that you take by mouth. And the most common one is like histol. Um, so I think those are, those are some of the main things that we tend to, to give those patients. And what has been described by the Embassy of St. Vincent and the Grenadines in ROC Taiwan as a partnership of benevolence. ASUS Foundation, a Taiwan-based uh, multinational computer hardware and consumer electronics company, on June 8, 2022, delivered to the embassy 100 laptop computers. According to the embassy, the items of the partnership, the terms, sorry, of the partnership were the embassy using funds raised by the Tunji alumni in 2021 for learning recovery in St. Vincent and the Grenadines following the devastation caused by the April 2021 explosive eruptions of La Soufriere. A purchase from ASUS Foundation, 50 laptops at a specially discounted company price, and ASUS Foundation donated 50 laptops to match the embassy's purchase. Speaking on behalf of the embassy, Ambassador Bowman lauded the cause with which ASUS Foundation entered into the partnership agreement, which rebounds to the benefit of the teachers and students in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The laptop computers for teachers will complement the 150 tablet computers which were donated last year by the uh, Shinko group in Yilan country for students in St. Vincent and the Grenadines who are most negatively impacted by the disruptions caused by the eruptions. In other news now, Kura's Distribution Limited yesterday officially opened its new warehouse and administrative center in Diamond, which cost $27 million. Given an overview of the construction of the facility costing $27 million, Chief Executive Officer of Kura's Distribution, Jimmy Ford, said the previous facility in Kingstown had a lot of challenges. Ford said the relocation to Diamond Diamond doesn't mean the wholesale operation in Kingston will be closed. One, to improve the quality of products and services we deliver to our customers and the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Two, to increase our storage capacity and grow our and our growth potential. We simply have no place for expansion in Kingston. This new facility has doubled our dry storage capacity and has increased our cold storage capacity by over 300%. Not only did we double the square footage of our warehouse space from 25,000 to 56,000 square feet, but we have increased our pallet positions by, by going higher from four to six pallets high, which gives us a, a significant increase in our storage capacity. Our greatest increase, however, is in our cold storage facility. In Kingston, we only had storage for about seven 40-foot containers, while we now have storage for over 30 40-foot containers. Area Representative Frederick Stevenson said the Diamond area is seeing a transformation on with the, all the new buildings now being constructed. Speaking of Kingstown being congested with lots of businesses, Stevenson said that the move to, that Careers has made to relocate its warehouse and administrative center to Diamond is a good one. Congratulate NH Construction on the great work that you have done here in transforming. We have uh, several housing development projects in Diamond, just across the hill. And if we notice that Diamond is becoming one of the largest and most fastly developing constituencies or communities in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The government, through the Ministry of Housing, we are going to ensure that their proper drainage works and roads are put in place in the housing communities across there in South Windward. And we're also going to have uh, the construction of just over $1.4 million in works for a community center for the community of Diamond. I would want to encourage 
other businesses who feel that Kingston is too small for them now, I say to you that you have a space in Diamond. Public Service Week 2022 will be celebrated here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines from June 20th to 24th. On the API's morning SVG program, Director of Public Service Reform Unit Emma Jackson said the week of activities is about appreciating the virtue and value of public servants throughout SVG. I know most of us get a bad rap, but if you take out the public service or servants out of the equation, I'm wondering how the equilibrium is going to look like, mm -hmm. okay? So we really need to appreciate our public servants and we do this through a series of activities and at the same time educating not just the pop, um, each other in terms of our colleagues in the various departments but also the public at large, what we do. So every year we come up with a theme, sometimes we follow the UN's team and sometimes we have our own national team. So this year we have our national team which is charting our road to recovery, affirming the sustainable development goals. And we know that's a UN 2030 agenda. And most, I, would, I dare to say all ministries and departments are ahead to most of the goals. Some ministries you can see goal one, goal three, directly as a mandate and others straddle across different um, goals. So this year what we've aim to do is um, highlight our road to recovery and I think that is pretty straightforward in terms of what we've just come out of. In some cases we're still coming out of it and um, we aim to highlight to the public where we are, what we've done in terms of the recovery efforts. It might be in policy, it might be in projects, it might be in systems. Jackson says one main highlight of the week of activities is a public speaking competition which will feature seven participants from several line ministries. We actually have a nurse, we have economic planning, so Ministry of Finance, we have national mobilization, Ministry of Urban Development, Ministry of Legal Affairs, Ministry of Education, I'm happy education is there. Me too. They're the master, <laughs> to a sense, and we also have um, SIPO. Okay. So that's that's interesting. It's a good spread. Yes, it is a good spread. So Unlike the secondary school competition, we have three categories. So we have the impromptu, the main speech. We added a creative costume slash wear. What we like to do at Public Sector Reform Unit, we like to educate persons at the same time, we train a little bit of fun because we recognize that when you do things in a fun way or educate in a fun way, it you always grasp, works out better. Yeah. It works out better. So again, just for the fun, because part of our objective is to have that relationship with our fellow colleagues, hence the creative wear, which minute points, so it's not going to take away, but just to you know bring that camaraderie, create a, put a smile on people's faces. So the creative wear will come out first, right after they will have their main speech and then they will have the impromptu. There will be two sets of judges for the public speaking competition, which has three sections, a main topic, an impromptu segment and creative week. Jackson says it is left up to the various participating ministries to come up with their own creative costume or wear depicting the theme for Public Service Week 2022. And it's supposed to be surrounded around the recovery efforts. So they can actually, we're leaving it really, as I said, up to them to come up with whatever outfits, costume, if they wish. It would be very interesting to see what they come up with. It would be very interesting. Um, it has to be within the team, so we're looking forward to that as well. The impromptu will come after everybody would have gone through their creative, uh, creative wear and their main speeches, okay? I was pretty um, pleased when the Toastmasters for St. Vincent and Grenadines actually contacted the unit 
um, they aim to coach I think they've already started their aim was to help the participants coach them into the way of delivery and poise and what have you so we actually have Lions Club and Toastmasters in the mix interesting prizes oh, so we partnered again with the different um, statutory bodies and a few other companies who have graciously um, supported in prices, trophies, um, venue, and we're really grateful to them. So they all will be present on that day as well. So it's at the Methodist Church Hall on Tuesday the 21st, starting at 7 p.m. So we, it's open to everybody, everyone. So Free admission. Free admission, obviously. Um, so we're hoping that the ministries themselves will come out to support their colleagues, families will come out, and the general public. I know public speaking is something that St. Vincent Grenadines love.